good testimony. That's what happens in community. Beautiful. Maurice, thank you for sharing your story with us this morning. I see you up there in the balcony. God is good. And today on Pentecost Sunday, we're going to dive into Bible school, if that's okay with you this morning, and get into the theology of the Holy Spirit, the study of the Holy Spirit, which is called pneumatology. So you'll recognize the beginning of that word, pneuma. Pneumo is a Greek word meaning breath of life. And it's where we may get the words like pneumonia, right? Comes from breathing. So you see the the marriage of that understanding. So Pentecost is not the birth. It was a big day for the Holy Spirit, but it's not the birth of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was... A, a word and a day and a time that was on the Jewish calendar even before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was a season where a Jewish feast would take place called the Feast of First Fruits or the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the Harvest. There are several names for it. But Pentecost Sunday comes from the idea that it comes from Pente, which is five, meaning 50 days after Passover. So Pentecost was a Jewish tradition. So we see on the day of Pentecost that it was a big day for the Holy Spirit. We know according to Acts 2.38, and we'll get into that in a moment, but there's meaning and multiplication connected to the timing of God. How many of you know that nothing that God does is ever random? There's purpose behind the timing of God. And so I want you to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was specified for this particular day and season. And we honor the Holy Spirit today. And by doing that, I want us to know what we believe about the Holy Spirit. Do you think it's important for you to know what you believe about the Holy Spirit? So I'm going to ask some questions that are theological questions. There are doctrinal questions today. Uh, One being, do you receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved? Or is the Holy Spirit a separate experience from salvation? Is it sanctification or is it a salvation issue? Um, A lot of doctrines are built off of Acts 2.38, and we'll get into that in a moment. But the, the purpose, the prophetic purpose of Pentecost was the idea of the first fruits, the harvest of first fruits being the opportunity for the multiplication of the Spirit of God. So I want to take you through the history of the Holy Spirit because we know the Holy Spirit wasn't just born on Pentecost Sunday. He existed at creation and through the Old Testament. And the way that we see the Holy Spirit activating through the Old Testament comes uh, through the lives of judges. I'll, I'll take you through all of the leaders where it it denotes the Holy Spirit residing or resting on them. But 50 days after the death and burial of Jesus on Pentecost is the culmination of the promise Jesus asked them to wait for in Acts 1, 3, and 5. The author of of Acts, Luke, says this. After his suffering, he's talking about Jesus' death, He presented himself to them, the disciples and apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, he said, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want you to see the math on this. Jesus died on the feast of Passover. He was buried and in the tomb for three days. That gives us then 47 days left until Pentecost. So when he he rises From the grave, he spends 40 days with the disciples and apostles. That leaves seven days after he ascends to heaven that he asks them to wait for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So there's a full week that he says, don't go, stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise. So let's look at the history of the Holy Spirit. 
Throughout the Old Testament, we see verses in Scripture that talk about the Holy Spirit residing or resting upon an individual, not in mass, but very singularly. BJ referred earlier to the burning bush. That was what we call a theophany. The Holy Spirit showed himself. And as you will note, when he read the scripture, he said that Moses turned aside to look. I believe the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament made himself known on individual leaders so that then they were appointed to lead and govern Israel. The role of the Holy Spirit was the how. It wasn't the what or the why, but the how. How are we going to walk out God's will and plan? So we see on the life of Joshua, the Bible says, after Moses, the Holy Spirit rested on Joshua and God said to him, now I want you to pray over him and ordain him as the leader of Israel. Then we see the next judge, Othniel, it said the Spirit of God rested on him. Gideon, the Holy Spirit rested on him and empowered him. Samson was was covered with the Holy Spirit, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, defeated a whole army of thousands by himself. The Holy Spirit rested on Saul, the first king of Israel, and he prophesied. And then the Holy Spirit was transferred to David through the anointing of Samuel, and the Holy Spirit rested on David. He wrote psalms and spiritual songs. He made decisions about Israel through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we see One of the minor prophets, Joel, prophesied that in the last days, the Spirit of God says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. The Word of God says it here, that your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. So Joel prophesies that in the future, a coming day, The Holy Spirit will not just rest on one individual as a representative of God's people, but the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Note that this was the prophecy by the prophet Joel. Let's look at the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. After this prophecy by Joel, there was silence for 400 years. There was not a prophetic word given And then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, the high priest of Israel. He tells him, your wife and you are having trouble having a child, but she's going to conceive and you're going to have a son and you're supposed to name him John. And because there was doubt in Zechariah's heart, the angel of the Lord shut his mouth so that he could not speak against the will of God in the meantime. The angel Gabriel appears to Elizabeth, his wife, and says, you're gonna have a son, name him John. And in Luke 1.15, it says the angel Gabriel declares to Elizabeth that her son John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. That's quite a word. So we know that John the Baptist, who would have by birthright inherited the leadership of the Levitical tribe. So he would have been the next high priest of Israel if he followed in his father's footsteps. But God called him out of that broken system. Had he followed his father, he would have been the one who would find a perfect, spotless sheep and would say, this is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of Israel. He would have chosen that sheep. He would have walked into the Holy of Holies. He would have poured out the blood himself. But instead, God called him out of that broken system and into the wilderness. So John, people thought, was like the second coming of Elijah the prophet. He was a crazy guy. He broke all the rules. He was out in the wilderness preaching, making way the way of the Lord, making the path straight for Jesus. He was a forerunner of Christ. And Jesus, although we don't know a lot about his early days, we know one instance when he's 12 years old, his family lost him and they found him studying under a rabbi in the synagogue. But we know very little about his anonymous years. But where Jesus' story picks up is is really supernatural and significant. Because in Luke 3, 22, Jesus enters the pool 
the lake where John the Baptist is baptizing people. And John says, no, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, this must take place to fulfill all things. So he speaks to John and submits himself to the work of the Holy Spirit that's been operating in John the Baptist. And in this moment, the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit descended on him, that's Jesus, in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. I want you to see here the distinction between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus could not descend upon himself. The Holy Spirit is distinctive and has a work and a separate assignment than Jesus does in that moment when he surrenders to baptism. The Holy Spirit is the go-between between between God and Jesus in that moment. It's important for us to see this, that it's also a prophetic and spiritual transference. This is why Jesus said to John, it must be done this way, to fulfill all things. Because Jesus understood that he was going to be the seed that would fall to the ground and die. He was going to be the one who qualified to be multiplied the Holy Spirit. He's the one that would take the Holy Spirit that was limited to just touching one individual throughout history. And once it came to Jesus, through his surrender to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, he submitted himself to God's process. And when he did that, there was a transference that moved from John to the Holy Spirit. And in this moment, we see the ministry of Jesus launched. Just like that, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. In John 12, 23 and 24, when Jesus prophesies, I want you to see the spiritual impetus on Pentecost Sunday and how it's all connected. Nothing is random. What God is doing matters. And it's so beautiful for us to see as we sort of un- uh, unveil and reveal some of the mystery of God. It just makes me want to worship. It makes me want to trust God even more with the unknown and the unseen. Jesus is prophesying his own death and he says to his followers here in John 12, he says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus then is prophesying right then that as he carried, he was a carrier of the Holy Spirit. Once he died and he was buried like a seed, he was then qualified to be multiplied. He bought, he purchased the right for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on all flesh. And it was poured out as promised on the feast of first fruits. Who would have thunk it? Nothing God does is random. And the first fruits of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened for the apostles and disciples right on time. I want you to see, though, where Jesus is overshadowed by the dove, there is a distinction. I want to talk about the Godhead. Is it okay if we talk about the Trinity this morning? There is a distinction. People have split. They've created different denominations over whether you call them expressions of God or persons of God. Um, I believe there is a danger in, in trying to encapsulate the nature of God. We want to explain God as we understand him so that we may worship him better and we may receive him more. But we, it's not our job to encapsulate him. And it's impossible for us to do that. One of the 12 attributes of God is that he is incomparable. He is not like any other thing. He cannot be compared perfectly. Any analogy we give will break down ultimately. But let's look at the Trinity and see who the Holy Spirit is in the Trinity. So they're gonna put up a graphic for you for, about the Trinity. And I want you to see this. There's a long word at the top called Perichoresis basically means the the unity, the triune symbiotic relationship between the Father, Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. It means, perichoresis means to come around, to rotate. An exact translation in Greek is a rotation. So it means almost like a wheel. These three things work together, moving the will of God forward. So in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is one third of the Godhead, a distinct expression within the Trinity. The Trinity is God, Father, he's creator, he's the mind. When we talk about the mind of God, God is the originator of all things. Jesus is the son, so God's the alpha. Jesus is the omega, he's the finisher. He's the one who signed on the dotted line with his own blood to make sure that we'd be restored. And the Holy Spirit is the power, the presence, and the process. You know, if I were to explain the analogy of the Holy Spirit, there are some who've talked about the Holy Spirit being like a a clover where there are three leaves but one stalk. Some people have described the Holy Spirit and the Trinity as um, being like the, the three versions of water. One is liquid, one is gas if it's steam, and it can also be ice. So you can see it in different forms, but it's essentially the same essence, right? But when we look at God as Father, as originator, as Alpha, and Jesus as Omega, I think it's important for us to understand that they are three in one. They cannot be separated from one another. You can't just have God. You cannot just have Jesus. And you cannot just have the Holy Spirit. They are connected. And we will see this even in a verse that we use to celebrate Christmas, you know, where it talks about in Isaiah, he shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Wonderful counselor is the name for the Holy Spirit. Everlasting father is the name for God. So we see even in the prophecy about the birth of the Messiah, he is three in one. So theology is the study of God. We're gonna get into that in the coming months. Christology is the study of Jesus, and pneumatology that we're covering today is the study of the Holy Spirit. So let's go to Acts 2, 1 through 7. If you have your Bible, you can open it with me today. The second chapter of Acts is is what most theologians uh, spend time on when talking about Pentecost Sunday because it, it, it narrates the exact occurrences for us that day. So it says in 2, 1, and 7, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They obeyed Jesus' instructions. I added that part. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. It's a little hot here in Carrollton today. We're having an air conditioner issue, but we aren't heating it up and putting tongues of fire on you uh, as a demonstration of, (laughs) it's hot in here, but it's not part of show and tell. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse five. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Verse seven, utterly amazed, they ask, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Verse 12 says, amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Between verses five and seven and 12, they list off in your Bible, you'll read it, all the Jews that came from all different nations that were gathered for the Feast of First Fruits that came from Egypt, Syria, Persia, they named them all in there. And they all heard someone from the group of 120 speaking their own native tongue. And they're amazed because they're going, aren't these Galileans? Basically, they were saying, aren't these country folk? Aren't these fishermen and farmers that don't even own books? How could they know our languages? 
So in that moment, they're amazed and perplexed. And what happens? This is Peter's greatest moment, greatest sermon right here. We don't have time to read the whole thing here, so I'm gonna explain it to you. But Peter basically says in the next verse, he says, oh, you're amazed? You're perplexed? He's speaking to God-fearing Jews, remember that. And he says right then, he says, this is that prophesied by the prophet Joel that he said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see dreams and your young men visions. He tells them right then, you're amazed by this? Well, good, because this is exactly the day that was prophesied to us years ago. He says to them, all of this can be yours. In verse 37 through 39, he says, when the people, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, I wanna stay on that verse for a minute. I want you to see right here that Peter connected the promise of the power, the prophecy of power to the person of Jesus. He called him the Christ, which meant Messiah. Why did he need to, when he's talking to Jews, connect that ancient prophecy about his spirit being poured out on all flesh to the man of Jesus? The reason he needed to do that is because they wanted the promise of the Holy Spirit. But he was telling him, the only way you're gonna receive this, there's one way to God, and his name is Jesus. It's absolute. He is the bridge of reconciliation. You have to confess, repent, receive him as your Messiah, and when you do that, then you will receive the Holy Spirit. This thing that you've seen poured out on us, you will have the ability to receive it as well. I want you to see this, though. For his audience that day, his point was Jesus is the way because they're Jews. He's talking to Jews. But each part of Acts 2.38 has become an anchor for various religious denominations. Catholicism built itself and its empire around confession and repentance taken from Acts 2.38. Baptists focus on baptism. Pentecostals focus on speaking in tongues. And Calvinists focus on the calling of God that is, it is talked about at the very end of that verse. So the emphasis of each has become divisive instead of unifying. And sadly, from the very thing given to us to bring us together have come doctrines that divide. We've replaced the work of the Holy Spirit with boxes to check off or to X out. Covenant Church is not part of a denomination, and as so, it is important to address with clarity the various beliefs surrounding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, both then and now. So today, I'm going to go over the doctrines of the Holy Spirit, and I will share with you our position as a church body. Is that okay? And I, I just want to ask you questions this morning. What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? So I'm gonna set you up today with a spectrum. Today I'm going to set up a, an extreme version of Pentecostalism on the far left, the most liberal ideas about the Holy Spirit. And on this, on the far right, the conservative views of the Holy Spirit on the very far right spectrum would be the Baptist perspective. Okay, I could talk about Catholicism or, or Lutheranism or Calvinism, but we're not close geographically to those religions or denominations. We are closer to Pentecostal and Baptist. So I'm gonna talk to you about where we fall on the spectrum between the extreme beliefs in both of these views. Is that okay? Okay, so as you can see, Far left Pentecostalism, and I'm only saying left because it's on the left right here, but far extreme, that wasn't meant to be funny, but 
extreme Pentecostalism and the denominations that are built around the idea, this spectrum I'm setting up for you is that this Pentecostal here does not believe you're saved if you don't speak in tongues. The far right Baptist view on the Holy Spirit does not believe you're saved if you do speak in tongues, okay? So these are, the, these are the extremes. I'm not saying every Baptist believes that, and I'm not saying every Pentecostal believes that. I'm saying on the far extremes, when you take anything to its extreme, that's what we're looking at, all right? Everybody on the same page? Okay, so this is our spectrum. You're not saved unless you speak in tongues. You're not saved if you do speak in tongues. So on this end is the belief that you are not saved unless and until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues. And as a part of that doctrine, you will not be baptized in water until you speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is greatly emphasized as the primary work of the Holy Spirit. And it's important for me to say, we do not believe this. Covenant Church, we do not stand at this place with Pentecostalism, okay? In fact, our founders left a denomination that had this standing because we do believe that the Bible says for those that confess Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that he came and lived a perfect life and died for their sins and they receive him as Lord and Savior. If you confess what you believe in your heart, you are saved. That's what we believe. So a little further, not quite that extreme, but a little further toward the middle is another stance from the Pentecostal movement that says there are some who believe that the first and only evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. So this person that's at this place on the spectrum may accept that you're saved without receiving the Holy Spirit, but that you have not received the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. That is not our belief either, okay? We believe that speaking in other tongues is one manifestation, but not the only manifestation, and not always the first sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I know I'm getting all up in your life, but the Holy Spirit doesn't just make you run the aisles, dance, and speak in tongues. He also makes you shut up, apologize, and examine yourself. There's been a lot of times where my thumbs were going, sending a reply, and the Holy Spirit made me delete the whole thing and answer with, okay. Anybody else? The most significant impact the Holy Spirit has had on my tongue is not to make it move, but to make it stop. The Holy Spirit has shut my mouth as many times as he's opened it. So right in the middle of this equation is the big question, do you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? And my answer is no, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. The Holy Spirit is in heaven. We need the Holy Spirit and the role and the work of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the will of God on the earth, amen? It is not, in my opinion, a salvation issue as much as it is a surrender issue, a sanctification issue. And I will go into that more in just a moment. So on the other end, let's say the far right Baptist perspective, on this end, their focus then is really on the fruit of the Spirit, when on there, that focus is more the gifts of the Spirit, okay? So on this other end, The belief is that everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit upon salvation. And I like that, but the only problem with that, with this belief, is you don't actually know whether or not you have the Holy Spirit because you don't believe in miracles, signs, and wonders, which is my problem with this belief. So how can you tell you have the Holy Spirit if you don't believe in miracles, signs, and wonders? So on this end of the spectrum, everyone gets it, but it has no power. That's my problem with this. Do you see the the goal of the enemy is to dilute the real role and work and purpose of the Holy Spirit? Is to either make the Holy Spirit a sideshow 
or to discount his power altogether and, 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 and dumb it down to where it's only simply things I can control, right? So this brings us to two views. We're going to Bible school today, is that all right? There are two views on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, miracles, signs, and wonders. There is one view that is prescribed and ascribed by this view, the far right conservative view regarding the Holy Spirit is a cessationist view. Cessationist comes from the word cease. The belief is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, miracles, signs, and wonders, ceased after the death of the apostles and the disciples, that we no longer need miracle signs and wonders. We don't need speaking in other tongues because I guess apparently the world is much better than it was back then and we don't need the move of the Holy Spirit anymore. We're doing so good on our own. Cessationist. Continuationist view is obviously held by the far left Pentecostal movement because speaking in tongues is a part of one of those demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. So they believe that that has continued even to this day, that what was given then is still given now. And I agree, we are a a continuationist church. We do believe in the manifestation of the complete fivefold ministry. We do believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of miracles, signs, and wonders. My life is not explainable without miracles, signs, and wonders. I've seen it. This view over here, though, really, really harps on experience. They build up experience. This far right view builds up education, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's important that we understand who we are as a body. We do not believe that anything God has given, he repents for and takes it back. He doesn't reverse. God doesn't know how to reverse. Everything he does, he creates something new. And I would encourage you in this way. This is what has really bothered me about the Pentecostal movement in the past is people going all over the country, you know, trying to have a revival and stir up some kind of, you know, exaggerated experience that they can say, oh, the Holy Spirit has moved because that is what they see their prayer and calling is God, do it again. My concern with that is God is at the very essence and core creator. He very rarely does something again the same way. God does a new thing over and over and over. So it's wrong for us to build a temple or build our our whole belief system around one way he moved one time. It's important if we're continuationists to keep pressing into everything the Holy Spirit has for us. And that is our stand as a church. So this view, the emphasis is on the gifts of the Spirit. And this view, the emphasis is on the fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at um, the gifts of the Spirit. I don't believe it's one or the other, but both. We need both the gifts of the Spirit which are knowledge, wisdom, teaching, speaking, mercy, service, generosity, shepherding, healing, exhortation, and leading. We need prophecy. We need revelation. We need insight, but not just those things. You know, when a church is built around the gifts of the Spirit, you'll hear a lot of verbiage about, give this offering for your breakthrough. There's a lot of verbiage about, God's gonna do a a suddenly a supernatural. There's a lot of uh, verbiage about divine intervention. There's very little training and teaching about stewardship, about discipleship. There's very little teaching and training on that end regarding tithing and how how to create a budget for yourself. But on this side, what I appreciate about the fruit of the Spirit is that the Bible said, let's throw up the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are important. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that 
that if you have not love, it says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and I have an absolute faith so as to move mountains but I have not love, I am nothing. I come to nothing. It's important for us to have not one or the other, but it's and both. Amen? That's why it's important for us to go to what is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Because this is what I've had a hard time with over the course of my life is people that can be a parking lot prophecy and prophet and they prophesy one second and then they cuss somebody out or they're rude to somebody the next minute. And some people that I know that do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues are some of the most Christ-like people that I've ever met. So I, I don't feel like it is my job or your job for us to say you have it or you don't have it, for us to say you're saved or you're not saved based on the work of the Holy Spirit. Because I wanna point this out to you. Somebody wrapped this gift. She may be in the room today and she may... Um, recognize it. It was put on my desk, beautifully wrapped, and I received it. I have received the Holy Spirit, but I haven't opened it yet. So I don't actually know what's in here. I, can, I don't know how many occasions I could wear it. I don't know how I could enjoy it. I don't know what it'll look like. I have no memories attached to what's in here because I have not opened it up, but I have received it. This is what I want you to see with the Holy Spirit is you can't separate the Holy Spirit from Jesus. So when you are saved, the Holy Spirit is activated in your life. The Holy Spirit works on your behalf, but there's a difference between operating in the Holy Spirit, being under construction and being filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is, it's a difference between, it's not transactional, it's relational. And this is how I wanna point it out to you, is when you get married, it said when you marry your spouse, you marry the whole family, right? You heard that before? Anybody know that's true? But it's not contractually so, right? There's no contract. If you divorce someone, you don't have to go through a contract and sign that you're divorcing the mother-in-law and the father-in-law and say, it's all your fault that this happened. It's not contractual, so think about this with Jesus. When you have a relationship with Jesus, you are betrothed to him. The Holy Spirit is getting you ready to be one with him. But if you look at the Holy Spirit as the wicked stepmother, you think, well, I, I'll relate to you through Jesus, but I don't have my own relationship with you. The other side of that is, is it's not forced. The Holy Spirit will not be forced so it's important for you to see the difference between receiving the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit when you are saved and opening it up to see what it is and what it has to equip you for your life. There are levels to receiving the Holy Spirit. So this is what I would warn you about is getting too radical in your definition of does everybody get the Holy Spirit when they are saved? Well, can you separate the Holy Spirit from the work that Jesus did on the cross? They're part of one being. It's the Godhead. You can't separate. You don't get one without the other. But have you opened up the gift of the Holy Spirit? You may have received it, like me, it was sitting on my desk. I could say, yes, I got that beautiful gift, but I've yet to open it to see what's in there for me. And I want to take you back to Pentecost Sunday and remind you of this. When people get afraid of speaking in tongues and all the stuff that can go along with it, I wanna remind you of this. They were Galileans who had been just given the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is go into all the earth and preach the gospel. Only problem is they only spoke country. They were country folk. 
but they needed language to accomplish what God sent them to do. So the Holy Spirit showed up in that moment and took 120 people who were fearful, eager, but unsure of how they were gonna accomplish what God asked them to do. And in one encounter with the Holy Spirit, they went from huddling in a room to going into all the earth. We need language today. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, he comes so that you have the right words when there's tension to bring peace. He can give you the right words to speak to uh, youth and young adults, to millennials. He'll give you the right words to talk to people that are di it's difficult to communicate with. You might be talking about your spouse. He will give you the language to speak. Remember in the Tower of Babel when God confused the languages? Because he said, if they're unified by language, there is nothing they cannot accomplish. The whole purpose of God sending the Holy Spirit was to bring a common union, a common tongue, so that all of us, and that tongue is surrender. That union is leaning into the will of God. Did you know your highest purpose and calling is not to figure out what God's will is for your life? I'm gonna let that settle in for a minute. Because there is nowhere in the Bible that God gave somebody a whole life plan. Never happened. Because if you had a life plan, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads you and guides you and says, yeah, the next step. The Holy Spirit is for living out your life. Walking out the will of God. He is here to empower us and to equip us. God's greatest gift to us was not a plan. And Jesus refers to this when he speaks to them about leaving. God's greatest gift to us is a counselor. So why should you want to receive the Holy Spirit? Maybe you are in this room today and you might be confused about where you've been or what you believe. I hope this brings some clarity. We were talking in the green room between services and um, Brian and Deanna Coleman, who are executive pastors here on staff with us, uh, told me today that today is the 30th anniversary of the first time they visited Covenant Church. It was on Pentecost Sunday. And if I may, I'll share some of their background. They were raised Baptist, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It surprised them. And so at the Baptist church, they were being told nothing really happened to them. And at the Pentecostal church, they were being told, even though you've been in church all your life, you were just saved because you just spoke in tongues for the first time. So they were confused about who we're in. One church tells us it didn't really happen. And the other church tells us all the years of learning about God don't count until we receive tongues. So when they came to covenant, um, my father gave, our founding pastor gave an altar call. And in the words of his altar call, he made it clear because um, they knew they'd been saved. They knew they'd had a relationship with God, but they hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit until recently. And when my dad gave the altar call, he said, come on, man, come down. You've been saved. Now is your time to receive everything God has for you. And that, in that moment, they realized that's what we believe, that we were following what we knew until something new came along. And when God said, here's a new experience for you, they opened their heart to it. So why should you want the Holy Spirit? Why? Because everything you're praying about right now, the will of God for your life, the purpose of God, and you think educating yourself and equipping yourself is all on you. Part of that the work, is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is there to guide you. He's there to save you time. He's there to speak to you in advance to warn you. He's there to cover you. He's there to comfort you. And the greatest reason you should want to receive the Holy Spirit is that Jesus himself said this to his disciples. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you and he will lead you into all truth. Can you imagine being one of the apostles or disciples 
and you've been with him, slept under the stars with him for three years. You know how he likes his hummus and pita. You miss his jokes and you can't imagine life without him, without a hug from him. And yet he said to them, it's not going to be worse for you with me gone. It's going to be better for you. Because Thomas, you're going to go to India and take the gospel and I can go with you. And Paul, you're going to go to Rome and I'm going to be there with you at Caesar's table. And Peter, you're going to speak to the Jews and I'm going to do miracle signs and wonders. Everywhere you go, your shadow will cause people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I can't do that when I'm still in a form of one man. I can only do that when I am multiplied to go home with each of you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is better for you. It is better for you if I go so that I can be multiplied. So I'd have to ask you this question as I close today. How receptive are you to the Holy Spirit? How much room do you make for a new thing in your life? Jesus' instructions to the disciples were this, wait, don't go anywhere until you receive the gift that's been promised to you. You're gonna need it. Don't go into that foreign country until you can speak that language. Sit with me, wait on me, and I'll give you everything you need to be sent forth. But how receptive are you to receive everything God has? Because we can talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. I can think about how I haven't done a good job in the past in my life receiving company How many of you are good with surprises with drop by guests? Anybody good with that? Nobody raised their hand, by the way. There's some spontaneous people. I remember when I was a teenager, my cousin who's in Colleyville, she'll laugh because she'll remember. Um, I I was super moody. I know it's a shock, but. (laughs) I lived in my head with my books and all that. So I loved my friends, but I had to know. I was not spontaneous. I had to know what the plan was in advance and get myself ready for it, you know, get in the vibe and um, yeah. And so one day on a Sunday, we all, our family, uh, Sundays are very sacred. We would all take a really long nap. I mean, the sheets are just not as soft any other day of the week as they are on Sunday afternoon. And so I woke up from a nap and my mom said, Amy, come downstairs, you have some visitors. And My best friend and my cousin were there to visit me. And I still remember to this day, I mean, how horrible am I? I I got my snack and walked right past them and went right back upstairs. I mean, I was like, catch you tomorrow. I mean, that, I was not very receptive to company, right? I know now y'all are thinking, man, she was horrible. I think I did come back down and we went to a movie, but it takes me a while to get in the mood, right? I think about that with the Holy Spirit. How many times does he spontaneously put something on my heart or speak to me and I'm thinking, I'm not not on that subject right now. And I turn my back and the Bible calls that grieving the Holy Spirit because he knows what the priorities are for the will of God in our lives. So my question for you today is how receptive are you? And my challenge for you is to encourage you to stay open to the work of the Holy Spirit. Stay open to receive. Please don't put up a wall of definition that says it can't be that way, that experience can't be God, and that experience is. And Why don't we just say, listen, God, if it's something you have for me, I want everything that Jesus died to pay for. I want it all. And it's important for us to remember he didn't die so we can follow him. He died, I mean, he did die so we could follow him. He didn't die so that he could follow us. But we live a lot of our lives going, if you'll just catch up, God, this is the direction I'd like to go. And I think what the Holy Spirit's calling us to do is simply wait, is wait on him. Make time in our schedule, in our daily routine. Would you stand with me here and at every campus? 
Holy Spirit is ready and waiting to do something supernatural for you. And what you've defined as supernatural may be some woo, and really it's something very natural that God wants to bring forth in your life. I believe, Covenant Church, we're called to be believers that demonstrate both the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, amen? Nobody's gonna care what we have to say about Jesus if we're mean as a snake. We're called to be a witness to who he really is. Are you committed today to receive the Holy Spirit? If you are, I'd like to invite you right now in this opportunity and just, it's very simple. Is just put out your hands like you're receiving a gift. And just repeat these really simple words. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. I receive you, I am open, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a shout this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I just really feel so strongly, Covenant, that it is our job, it is our role, to know what we believe because what you believe determines what you're able to receive, what you enjoy, what you experience. And you're not called to to just struggle through life. You're called to walk completely free. And I believe this week, because you've prayed that prayer right now, that the power of the Holy Spirit is invading like he did the upper room right now. Every area of your life where you've been trying to fight a battle by yourself, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you right now that the power of the Holy Spirit comes in like a flood, in Jesus' name, that it breaks up, that it blows away every lie of the enemy. Father, we thank you right now that as we lean into the work of the Holy Spirit, You're doing a new thing in us. You're doing a new thing in us. God, we see it. We see it springing up in the middle of the desert right now. And we thank you for it. We thank you for the new thing. We thank you for the new freedom. We thank you for the new territory. We thank you for the new real estate. Some of you have been battling so many battles in your mind that there's so much lost real estate right up here between your ears that the Holy Spirit wants to take back for you. It belongs to the kingdom. The enemy's tormented you long enough and if you want freedom, all you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, come in. Turn me from a fearful, hunkered down person to somebody who is ablaze with your will, God, and and the faith to, to walk it out. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you like a mighty rushing wind right now on Pentecost Sunday. Baptize us with your spirit. We don't want your spirit. We don't wanna just stick our toe in. We don't wanna just sprinkle. We wanna be completely immersed in your will and in your perfect way. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. You are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. A spirit-filled life looks a lot different than being driven like the rest of the world. The Holy Spirit draws, He compels, He pulls you, He undergirds you. He doesn't beat you with a whip at the back, that's the enemy. The enemy's voice is always disqualification. The Holy Spirit is an encourager, He's a cheerleader. He brings things together for you and tells you it can be done. It's gonna happen in your life. I challenge you right now to open your mouth and begin to repeat the words the Holy Spirit gives you about your future, about your life, about your calling, about your relationship. For too long, you've been repeating the words of the enemy. 
You've been saying how bad it is. You've been describing how desolate and how depressing your situation is. Instead, amplify the voice of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you right now that you're invading. You're bringing life to those areas that have been dormant. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit comes up and it breaks up that dry, crusty ground so that we can receive the seed of the Word of God. And we thank you that in this season, Father, your Word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what it was sent to. And I thank you, Father, this morning that there's gonna be freedom and deliverance for your children who want everything that you have died to give them in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, if the Holy Spirit is drawing you and compelling you into deeper relationship, maybe you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior. That's where you start, that's your next step. And right now we have the opportunity, Pentecost Sunday can be your spiritual birthday. All of heaven right now is leaning over for this moment. There's nothing we've done today that is more important than right now. If you wanna make Jesus Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you wanna pray the prayer, will you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking. I wanna see you're acknowledging before heaven so that one day, I see those hands, one day when you stand before the throne of grace, Jesus says, I knew you. You want him to stand up for you, it's important you stand up for him right now and say, "This, I want it, I need this in my life. I see those hands all over the room. Let's pray this prayer with them and let it ring out in this house. Father God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for my sin. I repent and I receive you now as Lord, Savior, and Master. Come into my life and make me new. And with these words, I believe that I am saved. Amen. Woo! Yes. All right. There are people all over the room who prayed that prayer and probably some who are watching online. And we want you to just text the word, I am saved to us at 64600. And we're gonna get you a seven day devotional. It'll be a blessing to your life where we can kind of join hands with you and walk the next seven days now that you're saved. So for everyone who prayed that prayer and for anyone who has a prayer request today, we have prayer partners who will meet you down in the altar today to pray with you and to agree with you. I hope today has been a life-giving message and brought some clarity for you on what you believe about the Holy Spirit. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do have to agree on Jesus. He's the only way, but He's a big enough way, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. And may He cover you with His name, Jesus. Good day, God bless you.